Inside Kern, I'm your host, Angela Granheim. Inside Kern's goal is to show you, the viewer, the human side of county government. These are the individuals who go above and beyond the normal calls to duty. If you've ever driven up Chester Avenue in Bakersfield, California, you've no doubt seen the old clock tower. Well, in this episode of Inside Kern, we'll take a look at what's behind that clock tower. Kern County has a landmass and population greater than several states. Preserving and showcasing this land's rich history from the Native American inhabitants to now is the Kern County Museum. Today we'll meet some of the wonderful volunteers and staff that make a visit to the museum a quality and worthwhile experience. We'll also take a look at some of the features the museum has to offer. The museum is available for private and business rentals, weddings, birthday parties and celebrations, and the grounds can host groups from 10 to 5,000 people. Special events throughout the year include the Kern County Nut Festival, holiday lamplight tours, and Village Fest. Every winter break, spring break, and summer break, the museum offers full and half day camps for kids ages four through 11. Curriculum covers a wide range of science, technology, math, art, and other subjects. Here you'll find many exhibits that include Pioneer Village, where over 50 historic structures set on 16 acres creates an entire village where you can explore and discover the past at your own pace. Black Gold, the oil experience, presents a complete overview of how oil is created, different methods of discovery and extraction throughout history, and the dynamic role of industry workers and their family. The Lori Brock Children's Development Center with fun, hands-on activities and a playground. The Neon Courtyard, a growing collection of neon signs from a variety of Bakersfield's local iconic restaurants, shops, and more, all restored to working order and the Bakersfield Sound Exhibit with rare artifacts from the growth of one of the most influential sounds in music, the Bakersfield Sound. Feature exhibits include transportation, wagons, cars, trucks, and trains, industry, agriculture, and oil, entertainment, music, and racing, and things you would see in everyday life, such as a church, school, doctors and dentist offices, shops, and homes. The Kern County Museum is also one of the largest repositories of photos in California with over 400,000 images. You'll see a few in our show today. Let's get started. Uh, there's many great things out here at the museum for residents in Kern County and visitors to actually see. We've got the Pioneer Village, which is well known uh, internationally as well as nationally. People come out and see many of the historic houses and buildings that uh, really showcase Kern County. Uh, everything from uh, local banks that were here years and years ago to local residences that have historical figures that lived in them. Uh, we also have many, many events that take place at the museum throughout the year. Uh, we also have an education component that we work with uh, many of the schools that visit the museum and uh, actually work with the schools to provide educational components uh, when they visit the museum with their classes. Uh, so really it's a, a family-oriented facility uh, for residents and visitors alike. The Kern County Museum, basically it started back in the 20s. The main building at the museum was the old historic Chamber of Commerce building. And people would bring items down and they stored them in the basement, not knowing that they were going to start a museum necessarily, but they knew that they wanted to preserve artifacts related to the pioneers of Kern County. Then in 1941, a resolution was passed by the Board of Supervisors to actually start a museum, and it was in the basement of that historic Chamber of Commerce building. The various items that people from Kern County had donated were then set up into various displays, ranging from uh, fossils to uh, other historic items related to the county, clothing, photographs, guns, things like that. In later years, the museum moved up onto the main floor of that Chamber of Commerce building. 
Around that same time period, it's around 1950, the fair grounds, which encompassed the um, area behind the Chamber of Commerce building, they moved out to their current location uh, off of Ming Avenue. And so then the museum took over all of the grounds, about 16 acres that the fairgrounds once occupied. And the first building that was moved in to the uh, grounds area, or commonly known as Pioneer Village, was an 1868 log cabin built by Thomas Barnes. He and his wife, Jane, lived in that uh, log cabin with seven of their children. Thomas Barnes started off uh, in a little tooling shack, really, out sort of by Buena Vista Lake. And that was not uncommon. Thomas Baker also lived in a tooling shack that he purchased from Christian Bona, who was one of the really early residents in the 1860s of Bakersfield. And Kern Island is what the name of Bakersfield was at that time, or the area where um, Thomas Baker settled. When I first started at the museum, it was in 1998, and I had just come from a background in uh, anthropology, doing archaeology field work. So it was really um, kind of a culture shock coming to a museum where I'm working in an office for the most part and things like that. But um, and transitioning from prehistoric artifacts predominantly to more historic artifacts. sheer volume of the collection when I first started it was a little overwhelming but after 15 years you know I've gotten to know a lot of the items in the collection so if somebody asks me for a Colonel Baker artifact I can find it in no time flat. <laughs>was built in 1891 and the architect who designed it was a man named A.B. Chase. We know very little about him um, other than he worked for a firm called McDougall Brothers and several of the McDougalls actually boarded in the Howell House after it was built. They had practices in San Francisco and Fresno and Bakersfield of all things. The carpenter who built the Howell House was named John Singleton and he ended up building it for around $7,000, which is a lot of money in 1891. The three original members that lived in the house were William Howell, his mother Mary, and his sister Teresa. Uh, the house had boarders living in it as well, so they rented out rooms and people could come and stay for the night or several weeks or whatever uh, the requirements were for them to live in the house for a short time. Um, there are, we have a series of letters that go back and forth between William and his sister Teresa talking about the furnishings that she wants to purchase to put in the home. And those are kind of interesting. To, you know, they're debating over carpeting and um, beds and things like that. <music> William's mother, Mary, lived in the house for about six years before she passed away. His sister Teresa ended up deciding to become a nun. They were a devout Catholic family, and she joined a convent up in Oakland and moved away around the same time that her mother passed away, maybe a little bit before that. William found himself alone in the house, but with boarders, and they also had live-in um, servants. So, you know, he wasn't much of a cook, I suppose. So they had someone to clean the house and cook for the boarders, and they would come home either at lunchtime the house was within walking distance. William Howell was the county auditor for a while, and he was also um, involved in Security Trust Bank and various other business ventures. So he would walk downtown from his house and then could come home either at lunch or um, for his evening meal, that kind of thing, and for breakfast as well. And the maid would provide food for whoever was staying in the home at the time.
family owned the house until it was moved to the museum in 1969. So William Howell lived in it until he died, which was in 1960. And then um, his daughter remained in the house from the time she was born, which was uh, 1902, until um, she moved in 1969 to another home. Genevieve Howell was an interesting person. She worked for a time at her father's bank, Security Trust Bank. Uh, she also was really involved in um, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And she also taught piano lessons. So you hear a lot of people that come by the museum and they talk about you know, being in the house, taking piano lessons from Genevieve or things like that. The Howells also had a son named William Howell Jr. And he was an attorney. He went to Stanford University and was also served during World War II. As a uh, family, they decided that when they sold the house to the Bakersfield Californian that they would really put in a stipulation that the house would come to the museum. The Howell House here at the museum is known as a Queen Anne style Victorian house. Um, one of the distinctive features of a Queen Anne style Victorian house is an alcove that's kind of offset from the porch area. And that's a distinctive feature that you can notice uh, from the front of the house as you come to visit at the museum. We also have volunteers that will, they act as docents inside the house. They're in period costumes, so Victorian type costumes. And as you tour the home, they give you a piece of information about the family or the house, depending on um, which room they're stationed in. Typically in the bedrooms, they'll give more information about the family and then in the downstairs, more public rooms like the parlor and the office, they'll give you more information about um, the house itself. Hello, my name is Lisa Meehan and I'm a volunteer at, here at the Kern County Museum. Growing up as a child, my mother used to bring us down here, my brother and my sister and I, um, basically to play. And it was the most wonderful place in the world for us. Um, my brother was always the sheriff and my sister and I were the damsels in distress. And we used to go from, from building to building, playing and using our imaginations. I've always been a, a lover of history and this was just a, a wonderful playground for me as a child. Now when I work with the school children, I can uh, kind of give them that sense of excitement that I felt as a child uh, playing here. And uh, I've had kids tell me, this is my favorite place on earth. And I totally agree, it is my favorite place on earth as well. So we have a Southern Pacific locomotive that was donated by the Southern Pacific Company to the museum and it came in in the 1950s. They actually had to build a piece of track that went from the main line just to the uh, west of the museum here to bring it in. So there were a group of volunteers that set railroad ties and rail and the whole nine yards and then they um, pulled it in with a truck 
then they discontinued, you know, and t removed all that track and, and railroad ties and that sort of thing. But uh, it's the pictures of that are pretty interesting. They had a large, large volunteer crew here that day, getting everything ready to bring in this large locomotive. Initially, it was steam driven, so you had a boiler and coal would be fed into a burner. There's a tender behind the uh, locomotive as well. And then as time progressed, it was converted to diesel. Well, by the time the 50s rolled around, it just wasn't efficient. So the railroad had been contacted by the museum and the director at the time, his name was Richard Bailey. And then they decided that they could donate this piece of uh, locomotive history that had run through this area. Welcome to 2914. I'm glad you guys are here. I am um, Barbara Kelly. Everybody calls me Kelly. I've been at the museum since 2006. I uh, never thought about volunteering. Uh, I had a friend that worked for me for the Kern High School District and uh, I had just retired and she called me and said, Kelly, would you like to work at the museum? And I said, okay. My very first job here in the museum was actually here on this train. And um, I, I didn't know if I would really like it or not because I've never done anything like this. I've never really, I talk a lot, but I've never volunteered. And I came out here and the kids were so enthused. I thought, I can make a difference with these kids. So that's when I thought, you know, I really like this. So I started volunteering and I've been here since 2006. I uh, also do the Yokus Indians besides working here on the train. And once in a while I'll do the house or something else here, but uh, it's whatever they want me to do. And if you've never volunteered, I would suggest you do it at least one time and you will absolutely love it. When you see those little kids, the third graders face light up, then you know you've done a good job. two people to run this train. We have an engineer that sits over here. We have a fireman that sits over here. And everything that you see on this side of the train is also on this side of the train. It's just in a different place. This is the brake for the whole train. Say I got 20 cars behind me and I need to stop. This is a brake that's going to help me to stop. And sometimes when I work in the yard and I'm going to be moving other trains around, this is a brake just for this train only. This is the throttle. This is going to make me to go uh, frontwards and backwards and then this one over here is going to make me the problem is going to make me go fast and going to make me slow. The caboose was used for the men that worked on the train. It holds seven people and that is when, because remember in the 1800s, we did not have no Taco Bell or we didn't have no Carl's Jr. or we didn't have no Motel 6 or anything. So when the guys go along, they would be sleeping in the uh, caboose. It would stop. The engineer, guys, I hate to tell you, you still have homework every night. The engineer will be doing his homework every night. He has paperwork he has to do and he has a desk in there. He will sit at his desk and then they will eat and have their coffee and go sleep, get up in the morning and then they will start out again. The train usually goes about eight or nine hours, then it would stop and that's where they would go. We open up the cab of the train for school tours and special events and it sure is, uh, <laughs> it's fun to see the kids climb up into the cab and ring the bell. They get a real 
kick out of that and we have a group of volunteers that come down they're really dedicated they hook up the whistle to an air compressor and they're able to blow the whistle and that sort of thing which originally would have been powered by steam but uh, you know we make modifications so that we can have a little bit of fun here too Uh, well, I'm Bill St. Clair. I'm, I've been involved with the museum for 18 years. Uh, I've been a, a volunteer down here. I was on the oil advisory committee. I was also on the foundation board. Uh, and uh, so I've basically grown up with black gold and, uh, and some, of the, some of the things that we've did to make this a world-class exhibit. And when I say world class, I mean it actually draws people from all over the world. We've had visitors from every state in the Union, and we've had visitors from over 30 different foreign countries. Uh, it's, it's quite a draw. Uh, we, uh, the Oil Advisory Committee, we got together. We had about, oh, there was probably 10 of us uh, totally. Uh, all from the oil industry and uh, we got together and decided we wanted to put together a tremendous uh, oil exhibit and uh, we originally came down to the museum here and looked around the museum had an old building here on this, on this site uh, and they had some old artifacts there was some uh, drill bits a few things laying around so we decided we needed new cases and some more signage uh, we, so we needed to raise $40,000 to, to do that. Well, we started out and right away we had somebody give us $50,000. So we thought, well, huh, if we can raise $50,000, we can raise $100,000. So anyhow, one thing led to another and uh, what we decided, we, like I said, we wanted to tell the story. Uh, we ended up hiring a company out of Texas that takes care of these things, that builds museums and uh, got them on board told them what we wanted, what we wanted to do, and, uh, and they did it. Uh, it, was, uh, it was amazing, it really was. These boats work the same, they have oil on the bottom, they have a wick, that's called a wick that you see here, and you can either turn it up or turn it down, turn it in the This was a wick trimmer. Oh, the paper grass, I mean, I mean, it's still going to work out. We get uh, many, many, many uh, grade school uh, kids through here. I'm a docent, so I take them through. Uh, and it's an experience and educational as well as the entertainment. Uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a deal. What a geophysicist does, there's that word geo again, meaning Earth. Uh, in this room, we explain what is reflective seismic mapping. This section here is uh, drilling. This is where we now, uh, between the geologist and the geophysicist, we've decided this is the right place to drill. It actually shows you how it works. As you can see here, they have two ball bearings. One keeps it from going out, and it just keeps pushing the oil up, 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 up. built to show, to give you an idea of the size compared to a railroad track. It's amazing. It's a fantastic exhibit and it's used not just by school children, which we do get a lot of school tours, but also by uh, oil companies that use this as an orientation tool for new employees. And uh, it, it's, it's really a great setup. Uh, and uh, it's, it's something that, uh, uh, like I say, besides educational, it's very entertaining. Uh, I like to 
tell the story, and it's a true story. Uh, the museum here a couple years ago got a call, uh, and the call was from St. Petersburg. Not Florida, St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, so it just, just goes to show this is really quite, a, uh, quite an, uh, an exhibit. videos, hands-on displays, uh, it, it's, it's done very well. Anyway, it's, uh, I encourage anybody that if you have not been out to see the black gold, definitely come out. Or if you get Uncle Jed and Aunt Mary coming in to visit, well, bring them out here. I'm, they'll be impressed. They really will. The Kern County Museum continues to grow and evolve with the people and industry of Kern County. If you'd like to get involved, there are three ways you can help. If you like people, have a special skill you'd like to share, if you love history or you're just looking for something that's fun and interesting, you can volunteer your time or services. You can make a tax-deductible donation. Your generosity will help the museum maintain its diverse collection of historical buildings and artifacts as well as allow them to provide educational programs. You can check the museum's wish list for items they are always looking for, such as building materials. To find out more about Kern County Museum, to help or to become a general business member of the museum, visit the museum's website at www.kcmuseum.org and come see what's behind the clock tower. On behalf of myself and everyone at Kern Government Television, thank you for watching.